Um, so this is the, the elephant in the room, right? Bitcoin security. Um, so thanks, Mumia, for the introduction. I'm not sure all of that was exactly true. Um, but I definitely joined by some excellent people on the panel here. Um, I wanted to, uh, I'm going to let everybody actually do that little introduction and pitch in one second. Um, but um, I wanted to start this conversation with, uh, I know we just had a state of the Bitcoin. Um, I wanted to do a state of the security because it's, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a sketchy state right now um, when it comes to security of Bitcoin. So we've always had hackers on the internet. It's been something people have written books about, done movies about, um, uh, kind of almost created kind of mythical character around the hackers. We're in a very different environment right now. Um, it's no longer that we're being attacked in order to gather data in order to be able to sell it um, by a hacker. We're, we're at something which is a, a liquid asset and um, you know, becoming uh, increasingly valuable over the last few years. Um, the, we did a bit of analysis of the, the history of attacks over the last few years. Um, obviously, the Mt. Gox situation, you know, I don't sure anybody is fully sure exactly what happened there, but um, is the big news. But um, we've estimated that, uh, I think it's something like um, around 15 different exchanges have gone out of business. Um, declaring that they've been hacked, whether they were hacked or not is, is another, another matter sometimes. Um, and there are hundreds of thousands of Bitcoins missing up in, like before Mt. Gox happened. Um, so this has become a, a really significant issue. And every time one of these exchanges, or every time there's a story about hacking, uh, it's a negative for our entire industry. It's a, it's a situation which um, has a ripple effect across the industry. Um, and suddenly, it's inspiring us to adopt better standards and new technologies, some of which we're going to talk about today, but uh, it, it isn't helping our cause. And it certainly isn't helping people who are entrusting their assets with wallet providers or exchanges. Um, the, and it, it's, it's a sort of a full range of technology of hacking that's an experience that's being brought to bear. Um, not only uh, intrusion, um, which is the sort of standard technique of getting inside and controlling a, an asset, but also um, distributed denial of service, uh, which we all became uh, aware of during the transaction malleability, but um, we also think distributed denial of the service has been used or attempted to be used um, to manipulate prices by targeting exchanges. Um, ransomware, malware, uh, which you know, has uh, been proliferating around the internet, um, and, if, and just basic social engineering, someone calling up a data center and pretending to be somebody, getting access, next thing you know, they've got control of the assets, and uh, you know, things start disappearing. Um, and the larger the amount of coins that you're uh, controlling, the more resources, the more investment somebody's willing to put in in order to try and get control of those. Um, and this, you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit about my Gox in a second, but even this week, um, we're finding out that there's a, a couple of exchanges that look like they're going to shut down, um, a couple of exchanges that are saying that they've had significant funds uh, taken from them. And, um, you know, it's, it's still like, it's not a positive situation. It's not a positive landscape. So that's the sort of the state of the union for security. But we, we believe, and I believe, that there's some promise. You know, we're engineers, or at least I am, um, and, uh, and, and investors. And we think that there are opportunities here. There are obviously problems. Um, we're looking at uh, some promise in new technologies, uh, things like uh, BIP32, which is uh, hierarchical deterministic wallets. Um, BIP70 for payments, and multi-sig. We're going to talk about each of those things here, and also uh, some hardware initiatives. Um, we've started seeing some, some at least publicized you know, significant hires. Uh, Ryan McGeehan from Facebook has joined Coinbase. Um, there are other like, good security people that, that I know. I've actually hired one of them myself, uh, Jeffrey Paul at Pantera. Um, and we're starting to see like, key people being brought into this industry that have like, really strong experience from um, other aspects of, of the internet and are now uh, entering the Bitcoin space. <coughs> um, there's increased focus from existing companies, and there are startups being formed to focus specifically on security. So I think we're starting to see some promise, but we've got a lot of work to do to, uh, to get ourselves in good shape. So <laughs> having said all that, um, I'd like to... Uh, perhaps each of you go through and introduce yourself um, a little bit about what you're doing, um, talk about the companies that you're doing, and uh, we'll get into some, some, some more questions. Let's start. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Will O'Brien. I'm the CEO and co-founder of BitGo. 
BitGo is a security as a services platform uh, leveraging multi-sig, P2SH, BIP16, um, as well as hierarchical deterministic wallets, BIP32, to build a security platform that can be used for wallets, corporate services, corporate treasury management, uh, as well as anything in the future, such as exchanges with decentralized wallets, marketplaces, escrow services. Um, our foundational technology issues three keys for every wallet. Those three keys reside on three different devices or with three different parties, and any two of those keys can come together and sign a transaction. So by design, this architecture enables uh, the user to, number one, keep all of their funds on blockchain, number two, control the keys themselves. BitGo only ever holds one key, only ever sees one key. And so that way, <laughs> if, God forbid, somebody was trying to coerce or incentive, incentivize us or attack our servers, there'd be no way for them to access your holdings. Um, and number three, we enable these kind of services. So we have a consumer wallet at bitgo.com that's very simple to use. It follows an online banking paradigm of logging in and then using a passcode to sign transactions. So it's very easy to use. You don't compromise ease of use for the greater security. Um, our team is a, a team of industry veterans, um, digital currency and online security, uh, and we're venture-backed and we have a strong angel syndicate. My background personally is in uh, financial technology, capital markets. Uh, I studied computer science at Harvard. I built trading systems for four years for a consultancy. Uh, so I've been working in the Wall Street area and, and that area for a while. I then studied at MIT, did my MBA uh, there, and then have been focused on early stage companies, mid-stage companies, built a payments business here in Silicon Valley. I've spent the last four years at Big Fish Games up in Seattle, which is a video game publisher, a mobile publisher. So um, Bitcoin is awesome because it's the culmination of kind of everything I've had the privilege and opportunity to work on in the past, um, along with my team, and it's just, we're changing the world. The people in this room are changing the world, and it's just super exciting to be part of that. Uh, my name is Trace Mayer. I, I suppose I got started in virtual currencies uh, about two decades ago, uh, way back on Genie and Prodigy, anybody who remembers the old services. So I've been around this space for a long time. My formal education is in accounting and also in law and knowing a thing or two about computers. So when Pamir says I was one of the early Bitcoin thought leaders, I was publicly talking about it and writing about it in early uh, January of 2011, um, John Matonis and I. And uh, in terms of the companies that I've invested in, I was in the seed round investment of BitPay, who's helped process $150 million of transactions from merchants and not had any security incidents. Uh, I've also led the seed round on the Armory wallet, where we do cold storage. Uh, Alan innovated that. He also helped innovate the BIP32 standard for hierarchical deterministic wallets. And uh, we just announced uh, yesterday or today the Kraken investment, so I was involved in that. And for those people who've been watching the exchanges, it's, it can be very uh, unsettling with all of these security incidents. And yet, you know, when Bitstamp halted and Mt. Gox halted, uh, Kraken sent out a tweet that Kraken halts nothing because planning. And <laughs> so I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, but it goes to show that it's very important that the people that you're entrusting with the private keys, because you have to respect the private keys, uh, that they know what they're doing. And the Kraken guys, they had uh, looked at implementing, integrating Namecoin into their exchange, and they found a fatal <coughs> vulnerability in the protocol, and they fixed it uh, because the Namecoin development team hadn't fixed it. And so that's you know one indication that uh, somebody could have a, a good understanding of these cryptocurrency protocols because the programming around it, uh, there are just so many attack vectors. So I think it's very important to understand and appreciate the human capital that goes into securing uh, these private keys and building the tools uh, that we need to use for that. Uh, my name is Anthony Dioro, and the, the project that's most relevant to our discussion here is uh, CryptoKit, which I'm a founder and partner of. And CryptoKit actually came about after a hack. Um, Instant, InstaWallet was a disposable Bitcoin wallet system um, that had, I think, over a million accounts and they were holding on to customer funds. They got hacked, all the accounts and the funds in there were lost, and I'd made it uh, a goal of mine to come up with a new frictionless instant wallet system that was um, in much ways better than InstaWallet because our, 
didn't want to hold on to any customer funds, and that's the biggest thing. I, I've never trusted a third party with any of my own Bitcoins. I've never used an exchange in my life. And CryptoKit is a Chrome extension, Bitcoin wallet. All information is stored client side. Nothing gets sent to any servers. We don't house any passwords, don't know anybody's passwords. And we don't hold any Bitcoins. Everything goes directly through the blockchain. Um, we believe it's ex extremely secure. Uh, we've got about 6,000 users right now. But to take it one level further, another thing that we've been working, we've actually just got some prototypes done, is uh, a hardware wallet that actually ties directly into CryptoKit and offers a system where you don't no longer need to have a wasted offline cold storage system. You can have a little device, and it's eventually going to be in the form factor of a watch. And we'll have two of them, one that'll be a cold storage. They'll both be cold storage, but one will be a checking thing, and one will be a savings. And the private keys are actually created on the hardware device itself. It connects through Bluetooth or USB. And the private key never leaves the device. And it signs all the transactions, just like cold storage does. So uh, there's five partners involved in CryptoKit. It's myself, Vitalik Buterin, Steve Dack, who's my original partner, and Roger Ver and Eric Voorhees. So I think it's also important to have a good team backing it. And I think that we have that with the five that we have. All right, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off talking about uh, users. So if I've got some Bitcoins, what should I do with them? Put them in BitGo. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, so... Uh, and why? What? Why? And why? Um, well, so as you mentioned before, hackers are coming after Bitcoin. Um, you know, every piece of malware that's going to be built in the future is really going to, the majority of malware is going to be focused on stealing cash, right? Stealing Bitcoin. Um, today, if you look at the, at the IT security environment and the, the market, 30% of computers have malware on them. There's a myriad of attacks on servers. So, you know, back to uh, Anthony and, and Trace, and what we're saying is, unless you are an IT professional with a sysadmin, you know, and, and uh, somebody who really understands the systems can really protect your system, you need to use a service that can protect. But you should pick a service that is following a few key principles. You want to be on blockchain. You don't want to be off blockchain. If you are off blockchain in a pooled fund, you can have a Mt. Gox type of scenario. The government conceives the entity. It can be stolen, what have you. It can be an inside job. Um, Two is you want to control your keys, hardware wallet, uh, hardware key ma uh, management, uh, distributed multi-sig key management, what, what have you. But you want to be able to control your keys. Really, you shouldn't be entrusting anybody else in controlling those keys. Um, and then uh, three is look at companies that are taking leadership positions and following standards. I think as an industry, we're going to emerge towards standards, standards like multi-sig, standards like BIP32. Uh, and so that's, that's all important. I said, I, you know, I said put it in BitGo, obviously I have a self-interest there. Um, but it's, it's very easy to use. It, it'll give you that comfort and security, and then you can decide what your risk profile is going forward. If you want to store 100 million uh, in Bitcoin, you might develop your own manual security protocol. If you want to store uh, a million in Bitcoin, we have customers that have millions of dollars uh, st stored with BitGo, right? And that, they're comfortable with it. I think cold storage is, is kind of passe at this point. Personally, hmm. we'll come um, back to that. That's yeah, a, that's a we'll good, come back to that. good question. So I, I think you can evaluate the landscape. Um, you can hold Bitcoin at other, at, at you know, multiple places. Each place kind of has its own use. So for example, I have Bitcoin with Bitstamp so that I can trade, um, and I can monitor that Bitcoin with BitGo. We have an entire dashboard monitoring service. So if that that Bitcoin or Bitcoin at Coinbase so that I can buy and sell. And so I can monitor that on BitGo. So um, you pick the right tool for your purpose. So tell, tell us a bit, I'm going to give you a chance to really pitch this. So tell us a bit about the features of BitGo that make you say that you would want to put your coins at BitGo. Sure. And, to, and go in a little bit about, you know, maybe give us an overview of some of the, uh, some of the features in like multi-sig and so on that really do that. And everyone gets a chance to do this, but Great. when you guys first. So the, the origins of BitGo, my, my co-founder, Mike Bell, she was on the founding team of Google Chrome, and he developed Speedy, which was, is the protocol powering HTTP 2.0. Um, he's, a, he's a veteran technologist, and, and when he started getting into Bitco, uh, into Bitcoin, excuse me, uh, a lot of people in our network, our angel network, were looking to buy Bitcoin, and they said, well, how do I secure it? And cold storage was really the only secure way. So Mike started looking at the various protocol, areas of the protocol, and there's this area of the protocol called P2SH, BIP16. Um, and what it allows you to do is, instead of using a private key to unlock or sign a transaction on a Bitcoin address, you can use a script. And that script can be whatever you want. So Mike developed, and with our team, developed a security protocol where the script says, I have N keys, and I need M of them together to sign a transaction. 
And so the simplified and easy to use case is two of three. Uh, so when you log into BitGo, you create a wallet. One key is generated on the server. The second key is generated in a secure browser session encrypted with your passcode. And then that's, that encrypted key is stored in the cloud, so for easy access, kind of like a blockchain.info um, uh, approach there. And the third key is created and, uh, in the browser and secure session and printed offline. You can also bring your own third key. So if you're using Piper Wallet, you can print your own third key and bring it to you. So what that allows is those are three different systems, the server, your computer, and then the third key, which is offline. That means that if somebody attacks your computer, you have malware, they're not going to be able to get your funds. If somebody attacks our servers, they're not going to be able to get your funds. Um, and if BitGo goes away entirely, then you can take those two keys that were originally generated that's given to you on a piece of paper and come back and use an open source piece of software we've already published to get your funds back. Um, so we, we're not in the business of holding Bitcoin. We're kind of the security guard in front of the bank, and you are the bank. The blockchain is the bank. Um, on top of that, we're able to build schemes for businesses. So let's say Overstock.com starts accept, holding Bitcoin in addition to accepting it. Are, is Patrick Byrne himself going to have the passcode to the wallet, or is he going to you know, hold the key himself? No, he's going to have a finance team and people in his accounting department who need to send small amounts to vendors, who need to uh, audit the chain, audit the, audit the funds. So we've got a corporate treasury and business solutions suite that we're going to be announcing um, or releasing, excuse me, next month and have customers using that. So it's a foundational technology. The wallet is really easy to use. It's a proof case to help raise awareness for multisig. And I'd say it's kind of a goal for this ecosystem. I'd like to see you know, us moving from single key to multisig. The majority of Bitcoin's held in some kind of multisig um, or comparable secure fashion by the end of this year. What would you do with the Bitcoins? I, I really think that you have to take a practical approach. So there's a sliding scale. I had a friend, he was putting in, I think, $100 of Bitcoin uh, for his first investment. So he secured it with $100 worth of thought. And I get a message from him on Skype. He's like, all my Bitcoins are gone. What happened? And we tried to figure it out. But at the time, it was $180,000 of Bitcoin. Today, it'd be worth a $1.5 million. But he, he realized that he hadn't taken the personal responsibility uh, and he was securing $180,000 worth of Bitcoin with $100 of thought. And so, you know, if, you're, if you only got $100 of Bitcoin, you're going to look at the probability of a security incident and weigh it against the potential loss, and it's going to be a completely different value proposition than if you're trying to secure $200 million worth of Bitcoin. Uh, if you're trying to secure $200 million worth of Bitcoin, I think that uh, it's almost essential to use multi-signature uh, some type of best practices that we have from accounting and information systems uh, for cash segregation and, and segregation, segregation of duties and cash management, things of that nature. Uh, and we're building uh, into Armory multi-signature, uh, so we'll be able to do that. But I think that it's essential that we have what's called an air gap, that we have a, a, a device that has never touched the internet, that's never uh, going to touch the internet, and that's where the signing of the, tr of the, of the transactions happens. I think that that's essential. Uh, because, like, even with BitGo, there's a potential attack vector. Uh, GCHQ or the NSA could deliver a national security letter, get the SSL, and then pose as BitGo, which they've done uh, posing as Facebook. And so when we look at trust and how it's established on the internet, I think it's extremely important for us to take into account all the different potential attack vectors. And if you're signing all the transactions on your own computer that you can trust and you know exactly what software is running on it and the software that is running on it is open source and you're able to review the code, then it's much safer, it's much more trusted. And then you can broadcast the signed transaction to the network. And, and all the procedures that can go into the key security and the key management around that, the processes, uh, I think we can scale it all the way up to where we can be managing and securing hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin for different corporations because we don't know which particular employees might be malicious or incompetent, et cetera. So we, I mean, we, we also don't want to be sending Bitcoins into an address where we're not able to get them out. So it is a very challenging problem, but I think that we have the potential and the ability to build all of the tools that we need to to do this. But it's very much a cost-benefit uh, analysis that each individual has to do for their own use case. I think there's one thing you mentioned there. Can I respond to the comment about the attack vector on BitGo? Sure. Um, Go ahead. So 
if I, if I go to Las Vegas and spend $5,000 on a dinner, my credit card company calls me and says, did you really make that transaction? Now, credit cards are a pull mechanism, Bitcoin is a push mechanism. But those same kind of conventions that consumers and institutions are familiar with can be applied in a multi-signature fashion. So in the scenario you talked about the NSA spoofing the SSL, et cetera, the, if, the, if that was a real risk and it was a real amount of money in that wallet, the owner of that wallet could set up what's called a spending limit a priori that says don't ever, Bitco, don't ever co-sign more than X dollars, $10,000, $5,000, what have you, without a secondary offline approval. That could be the backup key, that could be a phone call, that could be a custodian. So when we look at, uh, as we're rolling, we're rolling our solution out to financial institutions, family office investors, these guys need the bank grade security. So the consumer wallet for $100 is a different story, but if you really want protection, you just make a rule, don't sign anything. So even that online interaction would get halted until the consumer, until the user um, <coughs> somehow outside interacted with the, uh, with the service. So I hope that, I just want to kind of address that there is, there are solutions. I guess one of the more meta point is that people kind of throw their baby out with the bathwater a little bit with the security, oh Mount Gox fell and what's happening. The reality is that security is a big problem, but the solutions are already mostly known and in flight. And so you've got companies on this stage and, and out there that are looking to solve all those different pieces, and we already know the solutions. So embrace one of these progressive solutions and let's drive awareness, especially in the press, about how these, <laughs> these things are being solved and, and Bitcoin is, is a stable uh, currency for the future. Yeah, I think that's definitely important that we actually do it, but then also tell everybody that we've done it. That's right. Let's, let's, let's do both. Um, I think one point I wanted to point out, Trace, is that assuming that your computer is safe and no one else is on it or compromised it is, is, a, is an assumption. Yeah, but if you're running a, an off-the-shelf computer that, uh, and you know the, the, the software think. that you're running on it, it's a lot easier to secure. I mean... We, we've got Linux kernel exploits that can get in right at the very beginning. I mean, some of our mobile phones uh, have, have a lot of these exploits in them. It's just, I think that having that air gap uh, is, is essential for uh, just making sure that you know what is going into uh, your, your security software. And then also with the wallets that you're using, I mean, we've got a bunch of different attack vectors uh, there, for example, how is your entropy generated? Uh, can we trust the random number generators? Uh, things of that nature. So, uh, it, I mean, there's a lot of different attack vectors that that people can exploit to get at your private keys. Anthony, what are your coins? I'm going to make mine very simple. When people ask me what wallet should I use. I usually ask them, how long have they been involved in Bitcoin? Do you understand how the systems work? Do you understand the many different types of wallets there are? And, you know, I always recommend to do it with very small amounts. Um, I always tell them, don't trust third parties. And really learn that there is so many different types of systems that are secure in our, their own rights. We've got paper wallets. We've got brain wallets. Um, we've got desktop wallets. We've got extension wallets. We've got offline wallets. There's so many different types. Each offer different features. And it's like, well, how, many, how much are you planning on storing on, in your wallet? And I'll give them recommendations at certain levels, but I just think it's really important they understand how the system of Bitcoin works, try with small amounts first, and then examine some uh, offline cold storage things and, uh, for, for larger amounts. All right, switch gears a bit. So what's going on with the exchanges? How can we have you know, 15 of, or more of these things going out of business, we have super high profile ones like Mt. Gox um, getting hit. Um, what's, what's the deal? What, they're, what's they're, they're third parties that you they're have huge to, targets, obviously. That you have to trust. You yeah. better trust them with your Bitcoins. And well, I, I'm sorry. No, I just so there, there's, I, there's definitely things that are going wrong. You know, this is a, a system. Um, there's obviously some practices that need to be improved, especially amongst the smaller players. Um, maybe there's a lack of expertise here. Let's remember that Mt. Gox stands for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange, right? And so well, let's, let's not do the origin story, but yeah. The what? <laughs> let's not do all the origin stories, but. Yeah, yeah, I, I no, but I mean, but the, the, the reality is that in the early days of Bitcoin, Bitcoin was worth a few cents or a few dollars. It was easy to build something without considering the implications if it became a really valuable global currency. And so um, the companies that are in the space now um, and the entrepreneurs, I mean, look at the, the circle funding round, look at 
um, the other companies, even the guy who pitched Atlas yesterday, I was very impressed. I you know, spent four years doing in fintech, and he's got global trading, fixed system, et cetera. Uh, you're, you're seeing people take, uh, I think, a, an approach of operational excellence, uh, government, regulatory, compliance, um, and thinking through these scenarios uh, ahead, learning from the mistakes of some others. So I, I, I do think the, the attacks won't wane, they will continue, but the, the takedowns and the collapses will wane over time. Yeah, I mean, there's no way to uh, prove whether someone absconded with the Bitcoins themselves or whether they were hacked. And I mean, is it their, I'm is sure it you have their exit chart. strategy? <laughs> you know, well, you then they found some more, right? <laughs> yeah, they found, like, oops. You, you just had them in the extra <laughs> pocket, right? Um, uh, not all the water buffalo make it across the river, right? And Bitcoins are, <laughs> uh, and Bitcoins are one of the, I mean, if you're, if you're looking for something to steal, uh, they're a great prize. Um, and, and so we attract the, the most skilled people at key, key uh, you know, the, the most skilled hackers are coming over and banging on all of the systems in Bitcoin land because the prize is so nice. And so I think it's just going to raise the standard of care uh, that we receive in the Bitcoin area uh, and from our service providers because the, otherwise they'll just disappear. And uh, with other services out there like credit cards, et cetera, I mean, there's billions and billions of dollars lost due to fraud, et cetera, in those markets. And so uh, I think eventually we're going to far surpass uh, in terms of um, percentages of losses, we're not going to have nearly as much as other areas because we're going to have to rise to that standard of duty. Well, and also those are relatively closed systems, so it's easier to protect that kind of system when you have a credit card network. Then Bitcoin is a very much open system, so there's a lot more attack services. So I think, I think your point is, is valid, is that we're going to have to adopt even better security techniques. Yeah, well, that's, what, that's why I like the air gap, because it drastically reduces your attack surface. Um, and so if we can, you know, if we can look at, if we can reduce that attack service as much as we can and then uh, protect against the vectors, I think that, you know, I think we can secure things very well. And, but then we also have to make sure that we don't have malicious actors who are absconding with uh, the private keys. So there's been a lot of talk about multi-sig for exchanges. You know, the idea that does, I mean, is this, is this a panacea if we put that in? Is everything better? Do, should, all, should, all, should all exchanges adopt multi-sig? Well, I think I think it's very real. Um, and if so, but, who, who's who's in charge? Like who who holds the yeah? So the keys? I, I think it's a very real option, but it's a new model. Bitcoin uh, fundamentally is a decentralized model, and so but then we have these pools of funds that are centralized behind exchanges. So the concept would be an exchange. Ha every customer in an exchange has a wallet with three keys, for argument's sake. One key is held by a customer. One key is held by the exchange, and a third key is held by an arbiter or. A, a kind of a middle middle service, BitGo as an example, but a middle service. There are business rules set up. So the exchange might have rights to withdraw some money from the customer's account for certain events that are audited, and the customer can deposit funds or can make trades, and then that arbor in the middle can sign transactions. So that means that none of those funds are at risk of centralized theft or loss. Um, but then you ask the question, well, Bitcoin only has blocks every 10 minutes. How would you manage that? And you can manage that by basically floating between confirmations. So if you have a half a billion dollars in uh, deposited funds from customers, you might only be seeing $50 million of trading activity within an hour. And so that would be your total collateralized risk. Anthony, your thoughts on that? Is multi-sig the answer? I think multi-sig is definitely a step forward. It doesn't even have to necessarily have three different parties involved. You could have the user actually using two himself. One could be printed out a paper wallet, put in a safe somewhere. You could have one that they're holding on to and then one held, held by a trusted party. I think it's a, it's, it's a good step forward and we're looking to that implementation in CryptoKit along with the rules as you mentioned about you might have certain limits of $200 or a certain amount of Bitcoins going out only requiring the one key. After you're hitting a certain level, you're gonna require two and then even other rules that can be in place for that. So. I think it's a good step forward. I also like the idea of, of hardware devices as well. Let's talk about that in a second. So Trace, I know you have some theories on centralization. So what do you think about multi-sig as far as who's in, charge, who's in charge of the other keys? I think Satoshi's big vision with Bitcoin is to create a, a trustless system. And so 
you know, the first thing we do is we, Satoshi releases this trustless system where you don't have to trust anybody. You just interact directly with the network. If you have the private keys, you can sign transactions and it's going to validate them uh, for the triple entry bookkeeping. And the first thing we go and do is we begin to centralize the, the holding of these private keys. And, you know, multi-sig is definitely a step uh, in the direction of distributing the trust of who's holding the particular private keys. Uh, but I think that there also uh, are probably other ways that we can accomplish this. Uh, I think uh, what Anthony was saying about having an arbitrator and so you can't actually uh, move the key, that they're, they're not all entrusted with the exchange, for example, I think that that's a step forward. Uh, but I think we really have to come up with solutions uh, where we don't necessarily even have to trust uh, anybody and perhaps we can create exchanges where we don't have to even trust a counterparty in there and we can interact directly with it. Uh, so I think that we have lots of different potentials and we're just going to have to build them out and there's going to be creative destruction uh, accomplishing that. Talk a bit about more about what you meant there. Do you have any ideas of those kind of exchanges, what they would look like? Uh, for example, open transactions could be used to prove our balances on the exchanges. Uh, Impex is another example that we already have where you have, uh, you can buy or sell put options and call options on the Bitcoin price denominated in uh, dollars, for example, but then it settles into Bitcoin. So you can still get uh, exposure to a particular uh, price, uh, euros or cattle or oil or whatever it is, but then you still settle it uh, into Bitcoin and you could do that all uh, trustlessly uh, using uh, things like uh, open transactions. So I think that, you know, we have a lot of different potential solutions out here and it's just figuring out a way to uh, garner the users and implement it. And it, I mean, for 5,000 years, we've, we've always kind of uh, defined property rights in a very centralized way where those uh, private keys are held. And, you know, Bitcoin and these distributed decentralized systems, it's, it's requiring us to change our paradigm, change the way that we view uh, the holding of the private keys and the property rights and things like that. So it's uh, we're going to have to apply the cryptography to all these new use cases. It's very exciting, though. Anthony, talk a bit about hardware. What's your vision now? So with with CryptoKit coming out, you know we believe it's extremely secure. We don't offer a frictionless system without usernames, without passwords. It sits in your browser when you need it. It's, you, it's there to use. But still, you know, it's, it's been the idea that we should have some other type of device that actually is holding private keys and signing the transactions. And I think it's a waste with the systems we have right now that are offline computers where you're basically buying a brick just so it's holding onto that private key for you. So something more portable, easy to use, I think is, is a good way to do it. And we've had the hopes with uh, Tracer that hopefully should be coming out soon. Um, but we've got something that I think is done with parts that are readily available and we can start mass producing it pretty quickly. And it's not just gonna tie into our wallet, but we could use it to tie into blockchain.info or we could use it to tie into other different wallet systems. Um, and I like hardware because we're also now looking to do a complete new password management system as well. Um, and we can use our device to do that. Basically you've got systems where you can you know, I'm not a fan of logins, I'm not a fan of passwords, filling in forms, usernames, and we've got systems like logging in with your Twitter account, logging in with your Facebook, but now we're developing a system where you can actually log in with your hardware device, and when you're sitting in front of your computer, you're connected through Bluetooth, it automatically knows you're there, it signs it with a key that's on the device, and that seems pretty secure to me, so I'm excited about the hardware thing, but there's also who's now creating the hardware device, auditing, Right. of the devices, and that's always an issue with, um, you know, an issue that have, that have to be addressed. So I think even with the exchanges, we need to see more auditing. We need to see more standards in place. I think Gox used to do transparent auditing up until, I think, a year ago, and then they stopped. <laughs> and again, and how is that so, not a, a word? So who, who's in charge of these standards? I mean, we, we, we've heard people talk about standards for Bitcoin, but, you know. I think it's responsible for wallet companies to work together. You think it should be a wallet forward. alliance, an exchange alliance? It's, it's it's definitely. Kind of and, and you're seeing... naturally emerge. Yeah, I mean, look at the origins of the internet and what developed was Trusty and VeriSign and you know, some of these standards came out um, when the internet was scary and new and people didn't really understand what was what. Well, it's scary. It's still, it's still pretty scary. It's still know. scary. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, think these, I think we're at a, we're poised at a place now where um, 
we're, we're seeing collaboration among the, the, you know, the key players coming together and saying, okay, wh where are we standardizing? There's already a, a pretty robust system with BIPs, with Bitcoin Improvement Protocol, towards adding to the Bitcoin uh, protocol so that we can have new functionality and standards that really improves the protocol. And then we're seeing kind of the community selecting the best of those and moving towards so BIP32, BIP16, BIP70 as examples. Yeah, and I think we're going to see uh, the creation of a whole new industry merging in a way what the accountants traditionally have done and then what our information systems auditors are doing yeah. uh, to, you know, with crypto property. We're going to see a new way of auditing and standardizing all of the and securing and make sure that all these keys are secured. So that follows on to the, probably the last thing I'll, I'll ask you guys, and then we'll get some questions from the audience. So one of the things I'm excited about is I think there are going to be really interesting business opportunities coming out of this, not just in Bitcoin security, but also in all the things that we're going to have to do to make Bitcoin really safe. And I think they're going to like start flowing into the rest of the internet, consumer internet, because we've been waiting a really long time for things like PGP to work, and now I have like hardly anyone ever used it, you know, apart from paranoid people like us. And then, you know, suddenly everyone's got a private key, everyone's got a public key. What do you guys think about the different opportunities that are going to come out of, out of this development, all this work that we're doing? I think in this space, like a lot of other things in the Bitcoin space, and I'll use, I use the example of, uh, of gambling, how I think Bitcoin is revolutionized in the online gambling space. Provably fair systems, systems where you're gambling online and there's a system in place so that the house cannot cheat the player. And that's something that really got developed in the Bitcoin space. And no game or no gambling site is actually acceptable in the Bitcoin space unless it has provably fair gaming, sorry, provably fair system and transparency of house edge and things like that. That's something that the Bitcoin industry did. That's why I think it's gonna revolutionize that space. But I think things that we're doing now as well is gonna revolutionize the Bitcoin space. Uh, with CryptoKit, we've also got PGP encrypted messaging in there as well. It makes it extremely simple to use. That can then be used that system can be used for other forms of um, communication. Mm -hmm. That can be used for, uh, as I said, password management, things like that. So I think we're at such an early stage right now. The systems are coming out. There's amazing people in the field. And so I think you, you think as, as investors, like you know, Trace is probably looking for things too. Do you, do you see opportunities, Trace, for oh, yeah, I think companies? You see like, the like spin and, outs of this yeah, space? Uh, Mr. Andreessen talking about you know, currency is just the one of a thousand applications in this. Uh, you know, our ability to abstract on top of Bitcoin using blockchain technology, uh, we can, you know, cars could be owned and you, you, you own them with the private key instead of with a property registry. We have proof of existence. I mean, with the blockchain, we're able to create an unalterable ledger. It's almost like we create a fact in the, in the blockchain and then we can begin building off of that. A lot of the things we do in Wall Street with hypothecation and rehypothecation and collateralization, settlement and clearing, would be able to do a lot of atomic trading just directly on the blockchain. Uh, Chevron could sell a refinery to Tesoro and all the different assets that they ha own or control under that refinery would just trade atomically right in one transaction in the blockchain. So, I mean, we can, we're going to be able to build out lots and lots of things that had to be designed into Bitcoin uh, in the very beginning, and fortunately, Satoshi, uh, whoever that is, you know what a Dorian is? It's an unconfirmed Satoshi, so. <laughs> um, so whoever, whoever he was, uh, Dorian or not. I was gonna uh, tweet that now. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the colder the storage, the lower the entropy, right? So uh, anyways, I mean, we're going to be able to build a lot of things out with Bitcoin, and, and it's going to take uh, years and years in order to do this, and it's going to be exciting, and it's going to spawn entire new industries and job growth, and I think it's going to allow for the accumulation of capital and the administration of it in so much more of an efficient way, just like double-entry bookkeeping, uh, led to the rise in the industrial age. Now that we're moving into the information age with the first practical implementation of triple entry bookkeeping being Bitcoin, I think that's, that's a tremendous innovation. We're gonna see a lot come out of that as a result. How about you, Will? What do you think the future holds? Yeah, I, I think we're on a natural evolutionary <coughs> path towards um, Bitcoin as a ubiquitous currency and as a ubiquitous protocol for this type of innovation. And the lessons we're learning and the technology we're creating just to make money safe right now is going to enable all sorts of industries that we, uh, innovation industries we haven't contemplated. Um, so just, I mean, since I'm the multi-sig guy here, I'll just use an example, multi-sig. Um, we saw a presentation about remittance, or you think about escrow, or you think about real estate transactions. Well, you can 
give one key to a seller and one key to a buyer, and the arbiter in the middle can say, when the transaction is complete, I move, I assign the transaction from party A to party B. So I mean, that, that kind of, that kind of, once you start to conceive that, you say, okay, now we've got technically uh, proven ways to keep money safe. How can we apply that to all these other industries? There's a reason that credit card fees are, you know, three plus percent, and it's because of all the the stack of inefficiencies all the way through. You, you have you know, fraud, fraud checks, customer support, issuance, all these things that take place, and you have to pay for that somehow. Um, but with Bitcoin, it just works, and it's much more efficient. So I think we'll see that kind of efficiency, uh, as you said, Trace, and that kind of inefficiency st stripped out of other industries, notarization, escrow, real estate, what have you, and beyond. Really, anything that is not a, uh, you know, a, a creative job, if you will, uh, could be replaced by the blockchain at some point. It's a good vision. Like that. Um, well, maybe you guys feel a little bit safer now. <laughs> I got time probably for one or two questions. What could be the role of trusted platform modules in uh, keeping private keys and uh, and uh, it offers pre-boot security, which is a kind of a uh, technical air gap and is in a billion computers and uh, being extended to wire mobile devices. Why is this not a factor in uh, creating a more trusted engagements in uh, Bitcoin? I, I think trusted computing is it's going to be something that will be revolutionary. I think all, every device that we have will eventually be a trusted computer. But I think what they're lacking right now is the software. And I think we're still a few years perhaps away before actually being able to use your phones or every, any device you have as a trusted computing source. Thanks. Thanks, George. I think there's a question in the back. Or... Could you just explain briefly what you mean by triple entry bookkeeping? What is the third column, so to speak? Uh, well, it's not a column. It's a validation that the, transactionally, that the transaction actually happened. So you have the debit, the credit, and the confirmation in the Bitcoin network. Because right now, we don't necessarily have that in our financial system. <laughs> it's a problem. Uh, quick question for Andrew. You mentioned a little bit about the... Um uh, I think I think it's Andrew Crypto Kit, right? So um, sorry, it's Anthony. Oh, okay, Anthony. Sorry. The question you 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 spoke a little bit about uh, hardware device um, to interact with your system. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that and and uh, what uh, your ideas are there, if you can? Sorry, what was the last part there? Uh, just if you can elaborate more on the idea of this uh, hardware device that you spoke about earlier that sure. uh, can interact with yeah, Crypto Kit. Yeah, I've actually. I've got one. If you want to see it later, you can take a look at it. But it's basically it's a small device. It's going to be a, a watch form factor. It's a little bit too big right now to be a watch, but that's the ideal thing. It'll be a touch screen, and it syncs up with CryptoKit. So you go into CryptoKit, and it says sync with the hardware device. It connects to the device, and it says uh, put a pin in. You set a pin twice. It then generates the private key on the device itself. And there'll be a security me mechanism there so that it, you can actually put it back in to make sure that you put the right key back or you're going to be writing down the code that it says on the screen. It then sends the public key to CryptoKit and it keeps the private key just on the device itself. So then when you want to go make a transaction in CryptoKit, it's going to ask that the device be connected and you put your pin in and that's going to authorize the transaction. It connects to, crypt to CryptoKit. It'll be connecting two ways. Right now, it's USB, but it also has low-energy Bluetooth. It lasts about five, six months, the batteries. So it'll be connecting through. Now, right now, there's still an issue with uh, Chrome extensions and Bluetooth connectivity, but it actually is developed already in the hardware. But right now, it connects and works through Bluetooth. And I can do some demos after. And it won't be IP addressable, so you can't... Ex it, it won't be internet connected. It won't have an IP address on the Bluetooth LE interface, right? I'm not the sure. The answer I, should be no. Yeah, then I, 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 then I'm, then I'm it's not internet connected, and you don't want that to happen. That's what you said. Yeah, I, I'm not the technical person on the team, but um, I can look into that for you. Yeah. 
Um, going back to the accounting question, um, so the triple entry really fascinates me. So actually, I just want to see what your take is in terms of is that actually a good business opportunity to innovate in terms of the, there's no accounting software right there to support that right now. So um, just curious what your thoughts are on, on all that. I, I think there are opportunities in accounting software and all sorts of ERP systems for Bitcoin. I think yeah, this, we, you know, when this thing takes off into enterprises, then you can just go around and start re-engineering systems. Yeah, I've actually already got a friend who's built a complete working integration for Bitcoin into NetSuites. Uh, so, you know, we, we, it treats it as a foreign currency like yen, et cetera. Uh, there are also potential uh, services that you could build outside of it. For example, let's say you shop at Whole Foods and you want to know that the, the, the entire supply chain of, of where you got your food from was organic, et cetera. Like, you could enforce that all right through the blockchain. Um, so, the increased transparency that Bitcoin can bring, I think there are just lots of, lots of opportunities there. And with, the, with, with uh, applying it to our public companies, for example, uh, you know, we'd be able to have proof of existence. So right now, when we look at a 10K from 30 years ago, I mean, how do we know that that was actually the 10K that, that was there 30 years ago? But if we're able to take that 10K and, and put it into the block, blockchain using something like proof of existence, then now we're creating the facts of the financial statement. So you can't just, after the fact, make an equity adjustment to, uh, that nobody's going to find out about. <laughs> so I think it's going to be very interesting seeing how all these things get applied uh, to protect uh, uh, investors' capital, et cetera. So how is securing, securing a Bitcoin exchange different from securing a normal exchange, right? It seems like we have many banks out there, many exchanges out there that have you know, used millions of dollars to actually secure their financial operations. Um, you know, it is the case that Bitcoin can be sent over the wire, but is that it? I mean, or is it pretty much the same? We just have to spend the money to actually get there. Yeah, I mean, you're, like with Bitcoin, you literally hold the private keys, the controller dominion over that asset. Uh, with banks, I mean, I think the private keys are held with the Federal Reserve, so even the, you have to be part of the Fedwire system in order to initiate the transactions. Uh, so, I mean, you, like, you're literally holding the private keys to wealth as an individual or a company, et cetera. I mean, we should be able to use a lot of the same processes around it, but like from a computer science point of view, I think that we've still, we've kind of taken more direct control over the actual asset. They've also got enterprise security people. I mean, a lot of these exchanges, you know, who's, who's on their security team? They're probably just not robust enough to be where they need to be. Mm -hmm. With Bitcoin, there's no recourse after, of theft or loss. There's nobody to go to and get your Bitcoin back, right? With fiat currencies uh, or with insured investments, there's somebody you can go to. So uh, the exchanges, I think what's going to happen is there's going to be this natural evolution where exchanges and financial systems are going to fall within the current rubric of what framework that we have, regulatory framework and systems, so that there's a familiarity with how institutional investors and private investors get involved in Bitcoin. And we're already seeing that with the second market and some, you know, some others, right? So that's going to happen. Um, we're just, we're on the way there and uh, solving these core infrastructure challenges right now and putting those solutions in the market is going to enable us to be more widespread uh, Bitcoin to be accepted by those types of investors. All right, we're out of time, actually. So. Can I just address that gentleman's question back there? Absolutely. It's definitely offline the device. You were asking if, if the device itself was, was offline. It's definitely offline. That's the, it, it never does connect to the internet. That's the whole point of the cold storage of the offline computer. Okay, it should. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we have another question back there, or was that? Are we good? Oh, there's a noise. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the panelists. Thank, Thank you. you.